and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up, I look at the news and top selling games from March 1988. I discover another way to write plus three disc images. I play some games, chat to Jeff, and end with an old favourite. But first, it's the news. popular children's cartoon, The Pink Panther, is to make its way into the computer games market. Gremlin graphics have got the job of bringing this oddly coloured cat to the screen. The game will see you controlling the character as it tries to steal items from households. Of course, Inspector Clouseau is close by, trying to stop him. The game should be in the shops in a few months' time, and be available for the Spectrum as well as some other popular machines. The advent of budget games has seen a large increase in companies setting up and selling cheap software. This year though, say Gallup, the budget market is set to hit 75% of all sales, which is a spectacular achievement. Bruce Everest of Codemasters says it's about time and that people no longer are willing to pay three times the price for the same game. Also happy is Ashley Hildebrandt of The Powerhouse, who says full price publishers can no longer get away with producing run-of-the-mill overpriced titles. Do you mean just like you did at CRL then? Hmm. Disagreeing with the rise of cheap software is, surprise surprise, Electronic Arts, who claim there will always be a market for premium quality software and that programmers cannot make money from budget titles. Continuing with budget software and Mastertronic have secured the rights to publish Activision's back catalogue at cut down prices. The first batch will include Ghostbusters, The Eidolon and Ballblazer. Other budget releases from other companies are also flooding in, with Racket pushing out Tierna Nog, Suivo's World and Heavy on the Magic. There are rumours that a new Spectrum is heading our way soon, but not from Sinclair or Amstrad. This one is a clone, and will be produced by Miles Gordon Technologies, the people who brought us the Plus D and Disciple disk interfaces. The machine will have improved features such as better graphics and storage, and will be much faster, or so the rumours say and software will be written specifically for the unit. The best news though is, it will play all Spectrum games. These are just rumours of course, so the end machine, if it ever gets completed, may be totally different. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. Riding high in the chart this month are Match Day 2 from Ocean, Outrun from US Gold, Star Glider from Rainbird and Driller from Incentive. And that was the news and top selling games from March 1988. <laughs> Back in episode 17, I covered how to write DSK files to a 3.5 inch floppy drive using your PC, and the end result is that you could use them in your Spectrum Plus 3 if it had a 3.5 inch drive. At the time I said there was no other way of doing it, and that USB drives could not be used for the task. This turns out to be partly untrue, as Jeff Neal recently pointed out. You can use a USB floppy drive, but there are limitations. Firstly, you cannot write protected DSK images like most games. The format will just not allow it to be written to a USB drive. Secondly, you cannot just take an unprotected DSK file and write it straight to disk. There are a few steps to go through. In this feature, I'll take you through the process of writing an unprotected DSK file, in my example Tasword 3, and also how to get normal 48k games onto disk. For this to work, you will need the following. A Spectrum with a 3.5 inch disk drive, a Spectrum emulator that will emulate the plus 3, a utility called Snap to Tap, a utility called CPC Disk XP, some blank 3.5 inch disks, a USB floppy drive, some knowledge of BASIC, and some spare time. Let's get started. First the easy stuff. How to get an unprotected DSK file onto a 3.5 inch disk and write it to the USB drive. First thing you need to do is create an empty DSK image that is compatible with USB drives. To do this, load up CPC Disk XP. To create a new image, click Disk Editor and then select New. From the options, select USB floppy drive compatible 
and then choose PCW slash plus three DOS. Click OK and you'll be taken back to the main screen. Click save to save the empty image. Next, select add files from another DSK. Select the DSK file you want, in this example, Taskword 3, and you'll now see a list of files on that image. Select all of them and click OK. Back on the main window, you will see the files have now been added to our empty image. Click save again to save the image complete with all the files. To check it's working, you can load that into an emulator. But let's get on to writing it. To write to a real disk, obviously make sure your USB floppy drive's plugged in, and load CPC Disk XP again. Click the DSK to file icon, open the image that you've just created, select USB as the method, insert your blank disk, and click write. And in a few minutes, the disk will have written and can now be used in a real plus three. This method should have given you clues about the next part, how to get games onto disk. The most important thing to remember is that you have to create a blank USB compatible file first before you put anything on it. Once you have an image, you can load it into an emulator and put whatever contents you want onto it. To get a game on that is protected, or indeed unprotected, first you need to load it into an emulator and save out a .sna file. Drag this into snap to tap which will compress the game and create a single load tap file. If you don't want screen corruption, there is an option for this, but this uses a little bit more space. You will now have a tap file of the game. In your emulator, make sure auto load is not set, insert the blank DSK file and insert the tap file you've just created. Open it in the browser so you can see the code length, set loading to tape using load T colon, Merge the header, and at this point you can modify it to make it easy to read and work with. First save the loader to disk. If you then rem out the randomised USR line, you can run the loader which will load the game code into memory. You can now save the game code back to disk. To get the right values, you can look at the tape browser to get the file start address and size. You should now have two files on the disk image. At this point you can add more games if you want, but for this demonstration I'm now going to write that image to a real disk. I use the same method as I did before, and it isn't long before I have a real 3.5 inch disk with the game on. I can now pop this into the spectrum and load it as I would normally. And there you have it, a method of writing DSK images to real disks. My thanks to Jeff for writing this feature and making me aware of this great way to do it. This is Bionic Ninja, released by Zeppelin Games in 1989. Yes, this is a game where the ninja is a robot, or is it the other way round? Anyway, the Icarus Earth defence base is under attack, 
and you, playing as the Bionic Ninja, has been sent to infiltrate the base and eradicate the alien infestation. This is a side-scrolling beat-em-up, and my first impressions are that the graphics were large and well drawn. However, the running animation only has two frames, so it does look a bit odd. The backgrounds are average and can sometimes get in the way, because the game is monochrome, as you can see. The screen scrolls smoothly enough, and using the four directions in the fire allows you to pull off various moves like low kick, high kick and punch. You have weapons too, a throwing star and a sword, however they don't seem to be needed for any particular enemies, so you can just choose what you want. The enemy, or as the game calls them, alien infestations, come in various guises. There are human-looking men walking about or floating on hovering platforms, and these often have knives or guns. There are robots that fire at you, and robots that just float about. At certain sections you can jump up or down to the different platforms, for no real reason I could see, other than to have some variety in the gameplay. The sound is very poor though, with just a noise when you hit something. Even when you reach the end of level, it's glorious silence. You are given enough lives to get quite far, but I never got past level 3 or 4. According to the game inlay, there are four distinct levels. Jungle terrain, the cavern entrance, the armory, and the control centre. I could only see the last two of these using a poke, but at least the game let me get that far. The mission has a set time limit too, so you can't hang around. The game is, to be honest, a, a bit dull. You plod on and on, fighting things, and it soon gets repetitive. The monochrome look makes everything look the same, and the enemies never change, at least on the first few levels that I managed to get through. Controls can sometimes be a bit tricky, and many times I got hit because the fire and down key didn't respond in the same time. Overall then a below average game, but it was a budget title, so you can't expect brilliant things. This is Ad Astra, produced by Gargoyle Games in 1984. Anyone who watches the show will know that I love shooters, and this one is one of my early favourites. It's a tough game though, with some nice graphics. There is a story that involves protecting shipping lanes in deep space, but who cares? Let's get on to some shooting. Ah, that familiar start screen and beep brings back the memories. The first treat are the huge rolling planets, or moons, or whatever they are, and these cannot be shot and have to be dodged. The easiest way to get past these is to wait for the planet to appear, which will target your position, and then move to the other corner of the screen and repeat. Once you get used to this it becomes really easy. In between these sections are various other levels, consisting of different types of aliens that are swooping in in 3D. They fly across the top of the screen in the distance and then zoom towards you, firing as they get close. Dodging the fire is tricky until you get used to the 3D effect. Firing back gives you an impressive laser effect, and you can destroy them or dodge them whichever is easiest. After a few sets of these, it's back to the planets for the next round. The aliens do change in between each section, and you do get different attack patterns, for example, large ships that drop square blobs, and flying saucers that take a lot of shots to get rid of. The graphics are great, especially for a 1984 game, impressive 3D effects throughout, and some nice sounds. The ship explosion is particularly good. As you get close to a space station, a code is shown on screen, and shortly after you are asked to enter it to allow access, and this completes the level. You've seen everything the game has to offer at this point, 
And from then on, things just repeat with the aliens being different colours. The game is, as I said earlier, tough, but enjoyable. And during the review I got further than I had done before, racking up a not particularly impressive 6 minutes and 2 seconds of play. I lost my last life while filming, due to one of the game's annoyances. Alien shots can sometimes hang around at the bottom of the screen, and because they're the same size as stars, it's easy to miss them and just go flying straight into them. This can be very irritating. This then is a fast, action-packed game with a nice variety of aliens and attack patterns, and it will keep you busy for a while. It was great to play this again, and I'm just going to nip off and have another go. This is Squares, released by Kaz29 in 2017. It is a very interesting idea, very simple and yet very addictive. The idea is to identify the coloured square that is not bright. Sounds easy, right? As the game moves on there are bonus levels where you can gain more time. Things start off fairly easily with large squares, and spotting the non-bright ones is quite easy at first, at least for most of the colours. Dark blue can sometimes be tricky. And gradually the squares get smaller and smaller, and the colours start being mixed together and this makes things a lot trickier. All the way through is a great little tune playing that suits the game well. Control is responsive, and for such a simple idea, this is very well produced. This is one of those games that ignores the usual platforms or shooters, or other well-known formulas, and introduces a new game type. It's a great game, and definitely worth checking out. This is Ground Attack by Silversoft, released in 1982. I love these early inlays, and Silversoft had some really good ones. Like many early games, this is an arcade clone, in this case, Scramble. The first level gets off to a somewhat pedestrian speed, the ground moves in character squares, and the control of the ship can be a bit temperamental. Once you get used to the lag, it becomes a bit easier to control, and in most cases, you don't need forwards or backwards, just up and down. You have two weapons as normal, a laser, and bombs. You can drop two bombs at once, and your laser can only reach a certain distance. However, it's useful to use this to gauge your height in comparison to the landscape. As the levels move on, the cave roof is added, and as each new section is cleared, the colour changes and the passageways get narrower and narrower. In the later levels, for example level J and beyond, it can be really very tricky to navigate. The missiles launch upwards, and there are some asteroids in later levels, but these don't move at a different speed to the landscape, they just sit there getting in the way. Unlike the arcade, there's no fuel limit. There are fuel tanks to bomb, but this just gives you extra points. At the start you are given a choice of game speeds, so if you find it too easy on the first one, you can always ramp up the difficulty. 
On speed one though, I can usually get to level N or thereabouts, which gives me enough of a challenge without being too frustrating. The graphics are 8 pixel character sized user definable graphics, and the sound is very limited, but this is a 16k game remember. It's not arcade perfect, but it does provide a nice challenge as the caverns get narrower. If you can get over the jerky graphics and sticky keys, it's not a bad game, and certainly worth a try if you like Scramble. Let's do let's do events because events are good. Events, um, events are yeah. good. I, I don't know about you. I always I've all I've been to every Play Expo since I think the first one I went to about four years ago. It might, might be in twenty twelve the first one I went to, hmm. and I really liked them. The the difference now though to then was that Dylan used to turn up with all his spectrums, didn't he, and have his own little stall and yeah, run Chucky egg competitions and things like that. And there were all the Spectrum crew would kind of crowd around them, and it was really really good. And he stopped doing that. You you did get a free Amiga out of that, didn't you? I did, and it was an Amiga twelve hundred as well. So yeah. I I didn't actually realise at the time um, how good an Amiga it was and how much it was worth. So <laughs> I'm I'm really pleased about that. But I said to him, I will buy the prize for next year, and I mm. bought a Spectrum Plus off eBay. Yeah. Um, and a new keyboard membrane for it. Um, mm. It's the prize for next year. Well, I think I've probably been going to Expo about the same time as you, then, because I started about then. And yeah. what what amazed me was the actual size of the place. Because from the outside, it just looks like, a, I don't know, a small events hall. But as soon as you get in, it's massive. It's a huge warehouse, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it's... I mean, I mean, that's a good one. There's a lot there. There are tons of pinball. Yeah. Which is which is great, because, I mean, you can play a lot of the games that are there in one way or another. Yeah, that, that, uh, that's the good part about it, because there are so many. At least you get to play on them. Yeah. Yeah, I like. I actually like going around and seeing how, how many different games I can get my name on the high score table. <laughs> Well, that's quite good fun. Funnily enough, it gets harder and harder as throughout the day if you have a few drinks. <laughs> <laughs> you go to the bar and have a drink, it almost seems to get harder to get your name on the high school. Team. Yeah, I wonder why that could be, yeah. yeah. What did you think of, what was it, the Revival? Revival, Rival, rival the Rival to whatever it was called the other week. R Retro Revival? Yeah. I thought it was excellent. It was a lot more, uh, it was a lot smaller than the uh, replay Expo in Manchester, yeah. which, which made it a completely diff different experience. So, for me, I went in, and what I wanted to do most, I didn't end up doing, but what I did end up doing, I enjoyed more. So, I, I wanted to go play on the arcade machines, but yep. I only got to play on Robotron and Donkey Kong, and then there were sort of queues behind them for the rest of the day. But that sort of forced me out, and to go look at stalls, and people, things that people were selling, and to chat to yep. people, uh, and obviously to go to the talks that Retro Asylum were holding. So, I did, I did more than what I'd normally do, which, which sort of made it into a different event, and it, for me, it was a different event, it felt different. It did, didn't it? I I really liked it. I think I think it's possibly the best event I've been to. I think, um, I think it was a bit too crowded. They needed to expand a bit. They could have at least doubled the size, I think, with the amount of people yeah. that were there. Well, I think it's the available space, though, isn't it? As yeah, well. yeah. But the, I I agree. The talks were really good. I and I I got I got some free books. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I thought, I'm, I'm good at getting free stuff at Expos. I, I, I thought I probably wouldn't be elig eligible to actually enter the competition, seeing as I was sat on one of the panels, so I, I refrained. Well, but that was before the panel, and as, as you said, you, your sitting on the p panel was very much a, um, Paul, we've decided you're sitting on the panel, come and sit next to Jim Bagley. It, it was worse than that when we first went in, he said, do you want to host it? You should have, you should have hosted it, and you should have been plugging the, the Spectrum show. <laughs> Given a little bit more preparation time, I probably would have taken up the offer, but, you know. Yeah. But the thing, but the thing with Manchester is that they've got a lot of other stuff there. They've got all the modern stuff. They've got yeah. net, land, land gaming. They've got cosplay. They've got uh, all that sort of thing. That, and that because that wasn't there in Revival, I think that, that made it better for me because I wasn't interested in that. I was there for the yeah. retro stuff. And the cosplay as well. The music of the cosplay can be so loud. You were listening to the music? I, I was paying attention to other things. <laughs> <laughs> You can't help but listen to the music. I wasn't actually watching the cosplay. I was playing games, or, or probably knowing me um, having a having a pint and, uh, <laughs> and, and talking to somebody, <laughs> being yourself or some of the retro gaming roundup guys or someone like that. So, yeah. you know. And 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 Warsaw, I really like because we could 
I could just jump on a train and be there quite quickly. And yeah, that, that, yeah, that was good for you. It took, do you know how long it took me to get home from Warsaw? How long? To put it into context, it took me about an hour and ten minutes to get there. Yeah. And it took me four and a half hours to get back. Blimey. <laughs> Anything, any, anything you don't like about them? About the shows, uh, yeah. I didn't like. I didn't p particularly like the celebrity stuff. It, uh, when they when they used to do that at Manchester, they had a few celebrities there, and you had to pay fifteen quid to have your photograph taken next to them. And particularly one celebrity who shall remain nameless, who just looked like he had a, a tremendous hangover and had no interest in being there at all. <laughs> and wanted fifteen quid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whereas if, if you stood about ten yards further away, you could still take a picture of them, but just not with you in it. Well, you could, could you get a selfie with them in the back room? You probably could, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the other thing I didn't like is the, the reduced spectrum um, attendance. Yeah, I, well, I mentioned that before, didn't I? I it, it's, it was very, very poor at the last Manchester. Mm. And were there any at Revival? I can't even remember yes, seeing Yeah, there was one right at the door and it had on a, I think it was a small 10-inch monitor yeah. playing jetpack. Yep, I do remember now. I, I keep thinking I'm going to um, hire some stalls and, and set up in Manchester in the in the replay one as a sort of mini spectrum museum with all the hardware and stuff like that, just as a um, people to come and have a look at all the different things that we've Yeah, you but, mentioned you've mentioned that before. Yeah, but it'd be a tremendous amount of effort and very costly because I'd have to put everything in behind glass cabinets or people would start nicking them or breaking them. What well, actually that? But actually talking about nicking and things like that, that is a good thing though. There is a lot of really good hardware out mm. and none of it seems to go missing you, I've never gone up and like there's been a console there and the cartridge has been missing or anything like that and some of the games are worth quite a bit these yeah. days did you notice at Revival there were certain consoles and they had a stack of cartridges next to them they had 30 yeah. or 40 cartridges just lying about ready to, ready to be used that, I thought that was incredible I thought it was incredible too that was really good so, oh, I'll, I'll, so I'll see you at the next Manchester one then shall I yep you shall I'll be there <laughs> sits back. Type in Connor returns for a guest slot in this episode. Recently I was going through some more old tapes again and found a few games that I didn't recognise. I didn't remember them because they were unfinished or didn't work. The first game I tracked down and according to your computer magazine it was called Mean Machines. The listing however differs as we shall see. The game was loaded into a real spectrum and for reasons I won't go into with a quick swap of the lead I loaded it into Spectaculator to get a digital version. When it first ran it didn't work, and I tracked the problem down to the section of code that loads the user definable graphics. After a few minutes I couldn't get it to work how the author wanted it, so I opted to change it slightly just to get the graphics in. Originally it tried to load in nested for next loops, and I had to change this to hard coded user definable graphic letters. At least it got everything working, and bingo the game ran. The intro screen was not completely right, but a bit more investigation I found when I originally wrote it I typed in line 7502 instead of 7520. I located the original listing, corrected things and finally the game ran for the first time in probably over 30 years. The game is actually called Race and it was published in Your Computing Magazine in October 1983 and written by Gareth Woodhead. It's a top-down driving game where you control a car going round a racetrack, avoiding oil and trying to complete laps. Yes, it's a bit like Super Sprint, but without the other cars. The controls use the cursor keys, which make it difficult at first, but if you know a bit of basic you can swap these around and choose whichever you want. It's not a bad game to be honest, for 1983, and a nice little challenge. The next game I came across was called Invader, and this took a bit longer to track down, as you can imagine. Luckily I found it in Popular Computing Weekly from October 1983. I do have the original magazine, so with a good copy of the listing I completed it, saved it and ran it.
and it crashed. I tried to fix some things and it crashed again and then started to auto list the entire program without any way to break out of it. I tried to fix it again and it crashed again, this time corrupting the listing. I then sat down and went through the listing line by line and everything was good. I looked at subsequent issues of the magazine to see if there were any corrections and found nothing. I was about to throw this one away, but during reading the instructions in the magazine, it mentioned a REM statement at line 20 and pointed out that it had to be exactly 20 spaces. But the listing didn't have a REM statement. Brilliant! Luckily, the magazine then informed readers how to change the machine code pokes if you missed out the REM statement. With that done, saved, I tried again, and it worked. What we have here, as you would expect, is a version of Space Invaders. The colour scheme is terrible, but that's how the game listing is. I suppose you could change it if you wanted. Both of these games will be available to download from my website in their original form. And this is probably the first time they've both been seen in over 30 years. <laughs>